friends and uh, we are getting started with our second lecture mm, I just wanted to make a correction um, about just the names of the people I mentioned earlier uh, I had mentioned Dennis Bennett and now uh, Dennis Bennett was uh, one of the people very instrumental in the in the whole charismatic renewal um, but he was actually a he was actually an Anglican minister who who got filled with the Holy Spirit and he wrote many books and uh, was very influential um, but um, there was another man called David Duplessis um, and he was the man God used to really influence many denominational ministers and including the Catholic Church um, introduced them to the charismatic uh, the work of the Holy Spirit so these are good names to know of, of course these are all from the 60s 70s and they probably passed or passed on in the 80s but these were people whom God used uh, uh, you know to bring in the charismatic move into mainline denominational you know the church that we would today we look at and say okay they're all um, denominational churches or Catholic church but God used these people in those days uh, to bring the the move of God into into those denominations all right so I just wanted to correct that I just wanted to mention the names of these people all right today um, so now we're going to move forward into um, this talking about signs of the times how can we say how can we get an idea of um, how close we are to the end of times right and uh, how do we uh, so we just want to itemize some of these things now uh, I'm not I'm not saying that we're going to try and you know um, uh, uh, try and predict um, um, predict the day or the hour yeah, that's uh, that's not uh, our goal uh, but our goal is uh, just to get a sense of how close we are and how uh, some of the things that are you know spoken of are all coming together uh, in fact, right before our eyes, right? And um, one of the things that um, um, Jesus told us is, he said, you know, uh, when you when you see these things, you you know, you you're getting to know uh, that you know you're very close. So uh, let me just go ahead and share the PDF, then we'll go, go through these um, signs. All right. So this is um, uh, this uh, the PDF that's been shared also on on uh, on, uh, on on your coursework section, so you can get a copy of it. So Matthew twenty four verse three, the Lord Jesus is sitting with his disciples. You know the disciples come to him. They say, you know, tell us when will these things be? What will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? So, so they are asking him. You know, what would be the signs? Uh, now, Jesus didn't rebuke them and say, how dare you ask me for signs of, of when I'm coming or anything. No, no. He went, proceeded in Matthew 24 to mention many things. Saying, look, all these things you will see happening uh, when it's the time for me to come and when it's the end of the age. So he actually proceeded uh, to mention uh, many, many signs, which we will which we have uh, some of which we have included in this list and then we've added more from other parts of scripture right so we are just going through some of these signs the first very important sign is especially with uh, the end time prophecy being fulfilled uh, we should always start off with the fact uh, of israel being formed as a nation this is a major movement towards uh, the fulfillment of end time Bible prophecy because uh, these last seven years, the seven years of tribulation has to do with the Jewish people. Uh, and in, in, in uh, Daniel chapter nine, uh, verses 24 to 27, when angel Gabriel is speaking to Daniel, he says, Daniel, these things, this, you know, I, I'm speaking to you about your people, your city. 
So it's about Jerusalem and it's about the Jewish people. This this um, um, seven year tribulation, the final seven, the last seven years of this age, the, it has to do in, in a big way about concerning Israel. So Israel had to be uh, recognized as a nation in order for many of these things to be fulfilled. And that's why we say, you know, okay, uh, Israel becoming a nation, being recognized as a nation is a major sign uh, towards the fulfilling of end time prophecy. Now, the prophets of old, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, they prophesied that God would regather all his people back into his own into their own land right they will be re regathered you know so he says um uh, that um that he who scattered israel will gather him and keep him as a shepherd does his flock that's jeremiah 31 10 ezekiel 37 which uh, many of us are familiar the uh, ezekiel sees the valley of dry bones and then god says you know ezekiel now, through the prophet Ezekiel, I will gather, you know, I will gather them from every side and bring them into their own land. I will make them one nation in the land. Right? So many prophecies about Israel being regathered as a nation. Now, um, from the time uh, Nebuchadnezzar came and, and dispersed, and they were dispersed because of that invasion, uh, it was uh, until 1948. We have, we have almost 2,500 years uh, before they could all come back as a nation. And so that's a long time, but that was it's a fulfillment of what the prophets had foretold, that God would bring them back to their own land and to their own place. Now, one of the things Jesus said is that uh, one generation so as Jesus began to, you know, explain to his disciples in Matthew 24, uh, he started giving these signs. He says, look, keep this in mind that all these signs will happen in one generation. In one generation, right? So he said in Matthew 24, 32 to 34, he said, I learned the parable of the fig tree. So he's, he's, you know, he's using a comparison and the natural fig tree. When the branch is ready and put forth, uh, you know summer is near. So also, when you when you see all these things, yeah, know that it is near. Right? So he's saying. So he's not against us recognizing that we are near. And right? he says, look, you, you know, even in the natural, you know, when you see the fig tree coming, you know, all becoming green and putting out the leaves. It's indicative that summer is almost here. So that's a natural thing that people are accustomed to. So in the same way, he's saying, when you see these things, then you know it's near. It's at the door. Right? It's, it's about to make its entry. It's about to burst in on the scene. And he said, he went on to say, one generation, the generation that sees this will see everything take place one generation now uh, Jesus was using this parable of the fig tree now some people take this a step further and they say you know the fig tree actually represents the nation of Israel right so uh, now that can be uh, what to say, backed up by scripture, right? Um, uh, for example, and there are several scriptures here in Joel, uh, uh, he, he refers to my land, God is calling his people he, as my land. He calls uh, his people as my wine, and he calls his people as my victory. Also in Hosea 9, uh, uh, he says, I found Israel, Israel, like grapes in the wilderness. So your fathers as fruits on the fig tree, uh, as in the first season. So, and also Jeremiah 24. So there are some scriptural, there is some scriptural basis 
for saying fig tree is symbolic or figurative of Israel because God himself uses that right so what some people have said now although Jesus himself didn't say it that you know the the, the when you see Israel become a nation then that it's that generation that he didn't make that statement but some people infer from Matthew 24 32 to 34 that uh, Israel becoming a nation is this fig tree that is putting out its leaves so this fig tree putting out its leaves now Jesus just gave it as an example he gave it as a parable but some people extend that to say well and Jesus said, talked about the fig tree putting out its leaves. It is Israel coming together as a nation. Now, I don't, I don't want to argue against it because uh, we know in scripture that fig tree is figurative or symbolic of Israel as a nation. So um, I, 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 I wouldn't argue against it. I would say, yeah, why not? Okay, it, it is something to keep in mind, but it's not something Jesus directly stated. He was just using it as a parable, but there's nothing wrong uh, because of the significance of Israel in end time Bible prophecy. Okay. So uh, I, I wouldn't argue against it. I wouldn't fight it. I would say, why not? Uh, even though it was not directly stated, it's, it's okay to extend it simply because Israel is very important in end time Bible prophecy. But the issue is, you know, uh, uh, what is this? How long is this generation? He said, this generation. Now, is this generation 40 years? Is this generation 50 years, 60 years, 100 years? What is, you know, what is the duration of this generation? So we can get some sense of where we are. Okay. So this is the only calculation uh, I'm going to be doing. But please don't quote me on it. In one of our earlier classes, somebody wrote an article saying, or somebody wrote a comment saying, you know, Bastash is just trying to predict when Christ is coming and all that. So I was like, no, that's not the point. I am not trying to predict when Christ is coming. I'm just, you know, trying to use some logic here uh, to understand where we are, okay? So I am not trying to pr uh, predict the year. I'm just saying that, look, if he said one generation, and if we get to know what one generation is, whether it's 40 years, 60 years, or whatever, uh, um, uh, we can try to you know, have a rough idea, and that's all. So when I give you these numbers, please, uh, I'm once again saying, I'm not trying to predict. I'm just saying, look, let's just think through on this, OK? So what is the duration of a generation? now? One, if you go by the genealogy of records, that is uh, in Matthew, you know, the first chapter, uh, the gospel writer Matthew, he mentions all these generations, right, from Abraham all the way to Jesus. And he says it was 42 generations, which uh, spanned a time of approximately 2,060 years. Now, again, this is approximate, it's not precise. Uh, so it, it roughly gives us about 50 years a generation okay roughly so uh, if you if you do Luke's account 77 generations he starts with Adam all the way to Jesus Christ spanning 4,000 years this comes out to roughly you know 51 51 so let's round it up to 52 years so that's that could be one generation okay uh, please, okay, don't, don't uh, quote me on this. I'm just <laughs> just trying to think on things, okay? Second, uh, we can look at a generation as a lifespan based on Psalm 90. It's three score years and 10, or if there's grace, it may be 80 years, right? That's Psalm 90, verse 10. Or if you go back to Genesis, it's 120 years. Uh, you, a, a person would live for, for 120 years. So we have three options. You know, you could uh, take the 52-year uh, time, you could take the 70, you could take whatever, you know. So um, 
you know, which, which, you know, you can start with any date. You can start with the 1948 date. That's the time Israel became a nation, but they only recaptured Jerusalem in 1967. So if you want to move it to that, you can do your calculation. And I just did calculation here from 1967. Um, if you do 52 years, if we do 70 years, we do 120 years. These are some numbers that we get. Okay, so uh, repeating once again, uh, it's not our intent to set a specific date or to guess the year of the Lord's return. I'm just trying to say, look, if we look at one generation from the time Israel became a nation or from the time Israel recaptured Jerusalem, which is, you know, they, all, they were able to take Jerusalem back, uh, at least part of it. Uh, and then you say one generation, uh, and we don't know exactly what that, you know, one generation is, is it 70 years or whatever. But if you do some calculation, you know, you kind of, you say, look, this is where we are. And I know Louis mentioned a little earlier, people are talking about five years and so on. So that's pretty close to, 2019, uh, sorry, uh, 2019 has already passed. So, uh, uh, you know, we, we are 2022. So uh, we are somewhere here. Yeah. You look forward to another 15 years or something, or if you want to really stretch it somewhere there. We don't know. We don't know. But it's, you know, we are pretty close. We are somewhere here. Okay. Uh, so Israel becoming a nation. Is a major milestone. It's a first major sign of where we are. And from there, you say, look, if we are saying one generation, we don't know exactly what that one generation is, but we are there. You know, we are living through that time period of one generation from Israel being a nation. Now, we are there. Now, whether it happens in our lifetime or whether it's the next, you know, the lifetime people who come after us, whatever. But we are in that time since Israel became a nation. Okay, so is this first point clear? Any questions, any uh, points you want to uh, clarify before we go to the second point? Um, is this clear? Any questions? Okay, Sri Kumar, your question, please. Thank you, Pastor. Pastor, I just want to know uh, when we did this calculation, is it based on uh, uh, when Jesus said this thing, it was he calculated uh, based on Jewish calendar, maybe whatever he said. So now we are predicting on a different uh, calendar. We are, uh, so how can um, just want to know? I understood what you, what you are saying, but I just want to know uh, that um, how can we come to a conclusion that this is the exact or um, what we are calculating is right. Or if you want to calculate, do we have to calculate from the Jewish calendar perspective? That's what I want to know. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Now, if you uh, compare the Jewish calendar with the Gregorian calendar, there's not too much difference. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, um, I think the Jewish calendar, somebody could Google it. Uh, the Jewish calendar has, I think, um, 353 days in a year or sometimes it goes up to 355 days in a year. Whereas our Gregorian calendar go is usually 365 days. So we're talking about a difference of 10 days per year. You know, So uh, it's not very significant, not much of, I mean, yeah, 10 in a, for our lives, if it's you know, 10 times seven, it makes it uh, 70 years. Um, but the the number of years uh, difference is uh, not very large uh, and so if if i'm not mistaken right i think uh, that's what it is 353 years uh, days in a year in the jewish calendar and some years it will be 355 days so um so that's the difference you know we're talking about a difference of 10 days Thank you, boss. Uh, yeah. Thank so, okay, Christopher checked it up for us. Yeah, 353 to 355 days per year. Thank you, Christopher. Yeah, so, you know, we are talking about a difference of 10 days and um, uh, uh, we, we, we can still arrive at a, some ballpark estimate of uh, where we are. Uh, 
uh, yeah. Good. Any other questions? Okay, so the first sign, which I think is an exciting sign, uh, but it's not, of course, telling us exactly. Yes, yeah, so look, Israel became a nation. And um, for Israel to become a nation was, was very significant, you know. Uh, when you look at the history that they were dispersed so many times, and, and uh, for the people to have a desire, the Jewish people, to have a desire to regather in that small parcel of, a parcel of land. It's like, you know, uh, it's not like, oh, we're going to go and take back this huge piece of land. No, it's it's actually, if you look at it, it's actually a very small piece of land um, from the Nile to the uh, Euphrates up north. Uh, and uh, it's not easy because it was Arab, uh, Arabs are all around and so on. But for the, for the Jewish people to have a mind to go back now, of course, there was a lot of problem, a lot of, lot of, I want to say, uh, bitter struggles, you know, that they faced, which in some ways forced them to go back. But for the Jewish people to regather there, and then to have a mind to say, "We're going to declare ourselves as an independent nation," to have the courage to say that, because you know, if you look at the 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 population, they are very tiny, the Jewish population. <laughs> globally, compared to all the other nations. They're small population. And yet for them to regather that and say, we're going to declare ourselves as a nation, and this is our land, and we want to be established here, it, that itself is very significant. Yeah. And uh, for them to receive support, and of course the United Kingdom was there backing them up, uh, initially, and uh, for them to receive that kind of support and say, yeah, we are standing with them, we recognize them as a nation, it's their land, uh, it was again a very significant thing, you know. So that's the start for us of saying, look, Israel is, an, is a nation, and it's now going to lead us forward into other things. What are the other signs we can look at? The second one is kind of related to Israel as a nation, and, and, and we will see quite a few of these related to. The second one is that not only did Israel or the people, Jewish people, regather in Israel and declare themselves as a nation, but uh, Jerusalem has become uh, a place of conflict, right? Now, and this has been going on, of course, from the time Israel de declared itself as a nation. Um, and, uh, you know, of course, the, the Arab nations around it did not like it. And then they, they attacked. Uh, and then in the, in the Six Day War, uh, the Arab nations were all shocked because uh, this was in 1967. Uh, when you, we had, uh, and again, I, uh, I think uh, uh, Egypt, Syria, Jordan, uh, yeah, I think three of them, and I'm not sure about Lebanon, but Egypt, Syria, Jordan, they, you know, like you're having three neighboring nations coming against one tiny nation, young nation, and uh, them being pushed back, and not only being pushed back, but this small nation taking more ground. So they actually expanded their territory uh, in the 1967 war, Six-Day War, and they recaptured Jerusalem. But of course, that became a major upset. And uh, in order to maintain peace at that time, the general at that time agreed to, you know, give, give the, uh, uh, the East Jerusalem handed back to the Arabs and some sort of a uh, peaceful resolution was put in place at that time. And uh, with the agreement that the Jews would come in and worship on, on the West, Western Wall. But 
ever since that time ever since that time it's it's there has been so many uh, wars Palestinians uh, and the Jews fighting around in and around Jerusalem and every now and then the conflict escalates and uh, it becomes a big issue you know the United Nations tries to intervene other nations try to intervene and they try to you know calm it down a bit but Jerusalem became for a long time became the epicenter of conflict it's quiet it seems to be a little quiet now i mean you do hear of you know uh, every uh, you do hear of ongoing incidents in and around jerusalem from time to time uh, but for now momentarily it seems to be a little quiet but jerusalem is very very volatile very volatile zechariah 12 verse 3 um, and God says, you know, I will make Jerusalem a cup of drunkenness to all the surrounding people. And they are going to come against Judah and Jerusalem. Right? And uh, uh, it's going to be a heavy stone. It's going to be a burden for people. And uh, nations are going to gather against it. You know? So um, this is, has happened. Right now, maybe there's some sort of a calm. Uh, perhaps the last two years, you know, the, the whole world has been absorbed with the pandemic and all of those issues. But one thing we can expect is for Jerusalem to become a very volatile place, much more than what we have seen in the past. Okay? So as we keep looking at um, what is happening, and uh, the nations are going to turn against Israel, um, the uh, Palestinian issue and the whole conflict around the Temple Mount is going to only get worse. Now, uh, that is something we keep looking at. And like I said, the last two years, things have, you know, the, the, the minds of the people, of course, have been distracted with the pandemic, but it's going to come back. It's going to come back. The whole Palestinian issue and also the Temple Mount issues around the Temple Mount, it's going to come back. It's going to re regain focus and it's going to become a uh, 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 boiling point for uh, a cause for nations to, you know, uh, come into a conflict, come into this serious disagreement and uh, it's going to happen. So, that's something to look at or keep our eyes on. And, you know, we have already seen uh, some of it in the past, but what we can expect is it is going to become a major issue as time progresses. The third uh, um, sign or indicator of how close we are is that for quite some time, the, or you could use the word orthodox or you can use the word fundamental uh, Jews or traditional Jews have taken it very seriously to rebuild the temple on the Temple Mount. And so you know, a lot of preparation has already been done, plans have been done, and you can go online and you can. Um, I think there is a website called the Temple Mount, or something like you know something like that that gives you all the preparations that have been made. Uh, there are video documentaries available uh, online where they talk about uh, just what what these Jews are expecting. They are expecting the temple to be rebuilt. They have made elaborate plans. They have identified, uh, you know, from their perspective where. Uh, the Solomon's Temple was where the most holy place was, uh, where they're going to rebuild the temple and reinstitute uh, the sacrifices. They've got everything ready, not only the vessels, the priests, uh, the right kind of animals that are needed uh, for the sacrifices, as was being done during uh, Solomon's time. You know, so all those preparations are actually 
done and ready now for quite some time. And that is also very interesting because uh, in our study of end time prophecy, we come to the conclusion that there has to be this physical temple because it is in this temple that this son of perdition, this man of sin, this antichrist is going to set himself up to be worshipped. So there has to be this temple and he's going to speak blasphemies against God and he is going to stop the sacrifices in the middle of the seven years. So it means that the sacrifices had to have been initiated. The sacrifices should have you know, been in progress for him to come and stop the sacrifices. Otherwise, it wouldn't make sense for Daniel to say very specifically that he would break his covenant and he would stop the sacrifices, right? So the fact that all this is in place, including the very animals they're going to use in the sacrifice, and uh, they've had some, I think it was year before, uh, before the pandemic, I think it was when they actually did a mock uh, uh, procession or this whole reenactment of how they would take the, the goat and uh, sacrifice and all of that. I think it was, the, it was 2019. I think that was the year when they actually did it. I mean, not in the temple, but somewhere outside, they actually reenacted those, those things. So, you know, so th this is the, these are the fundamental Jews or Orthodox Jews who said, you know, we are going to have this. Now, of course, it's, it's, it seems an impossibility right now. It just, it's like, that's not going to happen. How, you know, how could you, how could you build a Jewish temple on the Temple Mount and have sacrifices happening? How is that going to be possible? You know, uh, because right now there's a mosque, it's under the control of the Arabs, the Muslims. It seems impossible, but what we can say is, these people are ready to do it. How it's going to happen, we don't know. What the scriptures tell us is that, and I'm just trying to you know, put the pieces together from, from Daniel, that this man of peace, this, this leader who, who emerges, he is most likely going to broker peace and in some way, um, uh, enable the Jews to have their temple and to resume or to bring back these sacrifices. So that's part of what uh, he would do, right? He would make it possible for them to uh, to do this. Okay, uh, and this is uh, you see this in um, uh, uh, um, uh, Daniel chapter. Um, um, Daniel chapter 8, and uh, also in Daniel chapter 9, you see how he, he would do this, okay? Um, then 9.27, I'll just read that, Daniel 9.27, um, he says, then he, referring to this abomination of desolation, this man of sin, he will confirm a covenant with many for one week. That means he is going to establish a covenant, uh, a modern language would say a peace treaty, with many for one week, that is for seven years. But in the middle of the week, he will bring an end to sacrifice and offering. So notice what he does, in the middle of the week, that means in, that's the three and a half years, in the middle of the week, he will bring an end to sacrifice and offering. So he's going to stop it. So he is He's established a covenant of peace, but in the middle of the week, he will bring an end to sacrifice and offering. Daniel 9, 27. And on the wings of abomination shall be one who makes desolate. So that is, this man is going to move so speedily uh, to do abominable things. And he is the one who's going to make desolate. That's why Jesus referred to him as the abomination of desolation. So this is what Daniel 9, 27 uh, uh, rec records in, in Daniel chapter 8 uh, verses uh, uh, you know uh, 
11 and 12, Daniel said, Daniel chapter 8, verse 11 and 12, he says, he even exalted himself as high as a prince of the host, and by him the daily sacrifices were taken away, and the place of the sanctuary was cast down. Because of transgression, an army was given over to the horn to oppose the daily sacrifices, and he cast truth down to the ground. He did all this and prospered. So it's clearly telling us here that this man, uh, this Antichrist, is going to stop the daily sacrifices. He's going to oppose it, and he's going to desecrate the sanctuary. Right? He's, going to, uh, he's going to do that. So uh, therefore, we are saying, that this sanctuary, this temple has to be in place. And um, uh, this man of sin is going to stop the sacrifices. And therefore, point three is very interesting, that the Jews are ready to build the temple, the Jews are ready to reinstitute, reinstitute uh, the sacrifices. Let me pause here. Any questions on these three points so far? Israel, Jerusalem, the temple, three things all connected to end time prophecy. Any questions? Okay, so let's just do maybe one more. Let's, uh, so the fourth one. That we want to talk about is, um, let me see, was there a question there? Christopher, your question, please. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Pastor. I wanted to just uh, find out uh, from you with regards to um, what uh, possibly what the, what the uh, the Jewish people actually think about you know the, the end times, or at least um, what is their um, view of um, uh, their part in this. I mean, I know that. They all, they, I mean, they have, there are some fundamental differences in, in the fact that they don't believe that, uh, you know, uh, you know, Jesus, Jesus had come earlier, mm. uh, came, came on the earth earlier. But um, besides the fact that, you know, that they, they do believe that, you know, that the temple is, would be available to be rebuilt. Mm. I mean, I know that, you know, we are looking at it more from a, from a, from a Christian perspective here. And also a, from a biblical perspective, but do they have? Do they also have some some you know, yeah, you know, uh, views on uh, the Jewish peace, people themselves? Because the, this, I mean, the Israel and Jerusalem is going to be the center of of so many things that are going to happen uh, in mm. the future, including the fact that you know Jesus will come come you know will be will come down uh, on onto the temple a temple. Uh, uh, what is it? Um, sorry, I forgot. The Mount of Olives. Yeah. Yeah, Mount of Olives. Yeah. So, um, uh, just wanted to understand: uh, Do we have any indication about you know what they are, what they have, uh, what they have, uh, what they feel about it, and you know what they have also been you know thinking about it, and uh, what you know what is their view on this? Mm -hmm. Um. Yeah, and. Uh... In general, in general, right, what we can say is, um, see, they have exactly the Old Testament that we have, right? It's the same. So they read the same prophecies of Daniel and others. For them, they are looking forward to the Messiah to come. And to do all these things. And the Messiah is going to come in a very powerful way. The Son of Man is going to come in a very powerful way, Daniel 7, and establish his kingdom. So they believe the same end time prophecies, but as an expectation of the Messiah. Not, so in their minds, it's not Jesus, it's the Messiah to come. So they are looking at the same prophecies, but they don't see Jesus in it. And that's why when we bring up Jesus, they say, no, yeah, not Jesus. 
They're looking forward to the Messiah to come, to fulfill these things, but it's not Jesus. So that's why I'm talking about the, the very orthodox religion. There are some, there are of course Jewish Christians, believers who are Jews. We're not talking about them. We're talking about the traditional orthodox Jews who follow Judaism. They're reading the same Old Testament as we are, but they're looking forward to this Messiah to come. And uh, that's why Zechariah 12, while you were speaking, I was just uh, reminded of that uh, scripture in Zechariah 12, where, you know, it's going to be a shock for them to realize that the Messiah they were looking for is actually Jesus Christ. So Zechariah 12 says, you know, uh, uh, Zechariah 12 verse 10 says, I will pour on the house of David, on the inhabitants in Jerusalem, the spirit of grace and supplication. Then they will look on me whom they pierced. Yes, they will mourn for him as one mourns for his only son and grieve for him as one grieves for a firstborn. So, and of course the context here is on that, on that um, the battle of Armageddon when the nations are, uh, you know, all the nations are coming against uh, Jerusalem and, uh, and, and, and they see the Messiah coming to deliver them. But this Messiah is Jesus Christ, whom they pierced. And it's, they say, it says here, they will mourn. You know, so it's like, They've been waiting for the Messiah to come and deliver them. But in their minds, it was, it's not Jesus. But when they actually see the Messiah come, Zechariah 12, 12, 12, 10 says, they'll realize it's the one whom they pierced. And they will mourn. So to answer your question, they are referencing the same text. Literally, the same text. Genesis to Malachi. They are reading the same prophecies. But they're expecting Messiah to come. But not Jesus. And Messiah to come and, you know, deliver them and so on and so forth. Uh, and it's going to be I don't know. I don't know whether it's a pleasant. I don't see. I don't think it's a pleasant surprise. But it's going to be a, uh, you know, like the way Zechariah puts it, it's going to be a, a very sad thing in the sense that they realize their mistake when they, the Messiah they're waiting for, and the Messiah who actually comes and delivers them, is the Jesus whom they crucified. Uh, so, so do the um, um, Messianic uh, Jews? Uh, do they um, uh, they, they believe that Jesus? Uh, Jesus uh, they believe in Jesus. So, do they also, you know, uh, uh, believe in? Or rather, do they also believe the whole uh, New Testament, right, including the Revelation? The uh, you're, talking about, you're talking about the Messianic Jews. Yes. The, and, um, yeah, I mean, so Jews who are believers in Jesus Christ, they believe like like us, right? Uh, uh, so, you know, so like we said, you know, even among the Jews, there's a move of the Holy Spirit and they've come to know Jesus Christ and they believe just like us. So when I was, yeah, when I was living in the U.S., uh, part of the, in the church, we were going to, we had Jewish believers. And they would, you know, they were Jews, but they believed in Jesus. And uh, they worship just like us, you know. They, but then they had they they try to keep in touch with some of their uh, Jewish customs. So they would, uh, uh, yeah, they would, you know, they would do. They would invite invite us even for that uh, Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. So they would, you know, do that more from uh, uh, not because they think that is going to save them. No, they're already saved in Christ. But it's because that's part of their background. It has much meaning even. In the New Testament, so but as believers, they're just like us, yeah. Right. So I, I mean, I would uh, just 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 uh, 
comment over here, but I think they would also probably be quite surprised. Uh, I mean, I'm talking about the traditional Jews when you know when the rapture happens, and they realize that uh, you know that there is uh, there is an event there is an event happening which you know it's just like a, a you know second coming of of Jesus uh, uh, to uh, to way if you, if I may call it. Uh, which is uh, which has happened, uh, and and they 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 see that you know a lot of them, their their fellow uh, messianic Jews um, have mm. been taken in the rapture. I think that that will also become, be a quite a big uh, shock and surprise. For yes, them. yes, yes, yes. Okay, um, Alexa, I think we have time for your question. Please go ahead. Thank you, Pastor. Uh, I wanted a clarity on the Messianic Jews. Um, um, is it that they are part of Jews? Um, they believe that uh, Jesus Christ or the Messiah is yet to come. Is that the, the case that you are trying to make? No, no. So um, these are Jews who believe Jewish people are believed in Jesus Christ, um, just like the New Testament, right? So when you talk about the book of Acts, it was Jews who came to Christ, who believed in Jesus Christ, who were saved. And, you know, who, uh, that's how the church began in Jerusalem. Uh, so they were Jews who believed in Jesus Christ. So we would refer to them as Messianic Jews or of course, they were called Christians. Now, uh, within within this so-called, I mean, not so-called, but within this whole name of Messianic Jews, there are various expressions, right? So I don't want to say I know everything. No, I don't. Uh, there are various expressions. There are some Jews who are, or who, you know, who still, like I, I mentioned, they still, um, they believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and they still do some of the, the feasts, but they do it knowing that all everything is pointing to Jesus Christ, you know. Uh, so you have you have variation. It's not like everybody's the same. But in faith, that is, they come to Christ. They believe in Jesus Christ as Lord and as Savior, as the one who died for us. And just like how we believe, or just like how the New Testament Jews believed in the early church before it was, and then thereafter it was open to the Gentiles. So. There are Jews who believe in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. So that's what I was referring to. Yeah. Okay, Pastor. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay, last one. You're welcome, Elisha. Last one. Abhishek. I have a question regarding is the Antichrist a hybrid born to the fallen angel and human? Uh, from what we know in scripture, the Antichrist is uh, a human. Yeah, he's a man. Uh, he's not hybrid um, and an angel and a human, but he's a man. But he is empowered by the dragon. Yeah, Revelation 13 says uh, that the dragon gives him power. Similarly, there's this false prophet who is also a man, a man, but the false prophet is also empowered by the dragon, that's Satan. So both these individuals, the beast and the second beast, or the Antichrist and the false prophet, are humans, people, but they are empowered by Satan. Okay. Okay. Hey. All right, so let's pause here. I hope I've been able to answer your questions. And um, we're going to continue this next week. We will just go through the signs, various signs. Um, and uh, we will look at them. It's quite interesting. And also try to look at, uh, connect them with some of the developments we're seeing. I mean, uh, one of the signs we'll talk about is just the relationship between nations. Uh, you look at relationship with Russia and China, Russia, Turkey. Um, Russia and Iran, uh, uh, and what's happening around Israel. So you look at the alignment of these nations. It's pretty interesting because 
that's that's the way the Bible unfolds uh, things that build up towards the Battle of Armageddon. So uh, we will look at those things as well. Uh, uh, also very interesting is um, the 10 nations that would come together from the former Roman Empire, former Roman Empire, which is the European Union, which the European Union is a major part of, not exclusive, but major part of. And so when we think about the European Union, we think about what's happening there, we think about when they're getting closer to each other, which is very good. Uh, but then out of that are going to come 10 nations and uh, there would be one leader who takes over three others, who kind of controls three others. And that one person would be the Antichrist. So we'll talk about that uh, next week. Right. So let's close. Um, thanks for being on the class today. Uh, I just request somebody to pray and then we will dismiss. Pastor, can I pray? Please go ahead, Elisha. Our most gracious and everlasting Father, we bless your holy name this moment for the gift of life. And we thank you for the opportunity to be seated at your feet and to be taught these lessons about the end times. Father, we pray in the name of Jesus that as we keep studying these things, May we not only be interested in the events, in the signs, and in the uh, seemingly interesting narratives, but also, Lord, help us to prepare ourselves. Help mm. us, Lord, as we keep waiting on you. Help us to sanctify ourselves. As Apostle Paul says that those who have this hope sanctify themselves. We mm. also continue to sanctify ourselves as we await your appearance, O oh God, that you will not be taken, you will not be taken out by surprise. But when we appear in the heavens, we will see you and we will be like you. We thank you for this moment. We thank you for the life of Pastor Ashes. Continue to preserve him and preserve us also that we will continue to share this platform. In Jesus' mighty name we pray with thanksgiving. Amen. 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 Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much for being on the class today. Thank uh, you, enjoy, enjoy the rest of your afternoon, rest of your day. I'll see you all tomorrow. God bless. Bye now. Thank you, Pastor. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.